Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. If you don't have enough space outside for composting, you can do it in your garage with worms. Also, a lot of people like to garden organically. Today we'll give you some tips. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot, I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. Bill Abresh. Mr. Bill is a local worm farmer, and Tanya Ashworth is here with us today. Tanya is our local garden expert. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thank right. you for having me. Sir. All right, Mr. Bill, so worm composting. What do we need to know about the worms, though? Uh, red wiggler worms will do a hundredfold your investment. If you spend uh, $10, you'll get $1,000 <laughs> over a period of time because they keep giving and giving and giving and it's always organic. Good. You, what you're gonna get is you're, re, you're repurposing your refuge from your home and you're turning it into a uh, nutrient source for your plants to use and the results that you get are just wow. <laughs> I can tell, I like the passion already. Mm -hmm. As you like to tell you, it's mm -hmm. the wow factor. Okay, tell us a little bit more about worm farming. Yes, sir. Uh, some of the worms that we have in the region, we have basically two types of worms that you would find in your own garden. One is just a regular earthworm. Okay. It's basically it came from Asia in, in its, uh, where it came from origin. And the other one is the uh, African nightcrawler. Mm. That's the one that when you uh, dig in your soil and it turns out to be 10, 12, 13 inches long, that's the one that you want to keep. That's uh, the one that does the biggest for your soil. That tills up its own weight in soil 100 times every day. Wow. So that's pretty impressive if you have that. And uh, so, but the red worms, if you want to do home composting, uh, you generally start out with, a, with a, you know, a good amount, two to three pounds, wow. and then you can find them. I like to use a 35 gallon trash can. Okay and I put a little spigot on the bottom of the trash can so I can divert the water into a container because the water is so nutrient dense. It's, it's fresh wow. from the worm castings, from what you fed the worms. This is uh, part of my compost tea that comes off of my worm beds and the results that that can give you immediately uh, from your worms without having to harvest the worm castings is, is just phenomenal because you literally, you water your plant with that and you, then you see the results that are tenfold like what you would see without using it because that is calcium, phosphate, and potassium rich. And it also has microbes in it that you can use that help to uh, make your soil alive because the more soil that it's more alive, the more stuff going on in your soil will create more growth uh, above the soil. So I like to do red wigglers okay. and I guess uh, I started about 10 years ago and ever since then, it's been a run. I've been running. How, <laughs> how much more can I do? And the way I do it is I tell them to start out in a small bed, read a book, uh, get a book, get from your local uh, library. This is the one I started out with 10 years ago. And uh, I read it cover to cover. Right. And then even today I pull it out occasionally, but generally I get the knowledge before I want to do something. Okay. And then I, I start doing uh, raised beds and with worms in them, and it just took off from there. And then I found out that when I started helping other people to do their worm beds, I, I told them, start out with just Cheerios. How about that, though? My goodness. Honey Nut Cheerios are the best way to start a worm bed. They are, they're, they're, they're just so easy, and you could watch it uh, as far as the worms eating it and seeing how they do. Then, and you said this actually breaks down pretty easily in water. Yes, sir. Uh, give it a couple minutes, a cup of water, and then put that on your bed. And of course, your bed should always have a covering on them. Okay. And most containers that come with lids, uh, take the lids and throw them away. 
take the, uh, that's, that's the number one failure. Most people put the lid on it, and the next day they come back and they tell me the worms are trying to crawl out. On most compost, there's a lot of methane buildup mm. in a closed area, okay. and that basically suffocates the worms. Okay. So if you have an, an active compost going, you want to have as much oxygen flow into the bed, because if you don't, the worms will, you're like us. We just suffocate. Oh, that's good stuff. Yes, okay. yes, yes. And this is what everybody wants. It's called oh, yeah. black gold. Black gold, yeah. This is nutrient rich, a hundredfold for what normal uh, clay soil could give you. Wow. And I was talking to Chris earlier about how to maintain a garden. If you've got worms in your soil, you never have to till your soil. Mm. If you keep your soil covered with some type of covering, whether it be uh, straw, whether it be paper, just so the rain won't hit it because the rain is a compactor, it compacts your soil. Right. And then you're actually creating a layer for the worms to, to manage themselves. and. That's when you should also feed your soil because when you're feeding your soil, the soil will feed you. That mm -hmm. is my mantra of my what I'd like to feed tell. Feed the about. soil, the soil will feed you. Yes, I like that. Okay. So you keep an active soil and use worms to keep your soil active, and also your composting operation. The results, what you can have, are Olympic in size. Now tell me this: Why are you wearing the gloves? I'm wearing the gloves because this is so active. These guys are coming straight out of my worm beds. And the bacteria content, which is just huge, you always want to keep yourself uh, prepared because of bacteria and soil compost. You can't totally control your environment. And uh, I know I have to leave and go back to work after I leave. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, yes, it's, uh, oh, one other thing, sir. Um, I've got a bottle yeah. of water and I put a gummy bear in it and I'm gonna let this sit for a day. I feed my worms uh, vitamins because I know that that vitamin, it's, it's really good stuff. And then it's gonna end up in, the, in my worm tea. That's good. And if you wanna take it to the next level, you can bubble this to increase the bacteria content there, a bacteria content, and then you could feed that to your plant. The growth is spectacular. Well, yeah. well tell me this, what else can the homeowner feed their worms outside of the Honey Nut Cheerios? Well, if you can imagine this, everything you would eat in their home, except for meat products and milk products, uh, that's pretty much what you would give your worms because the worms really survive on sugary substances. I think I stuck a half a watermelon in there that spoiled one time, and a week later, everything was gone except for the rind. Wow. So I just knew maybe I shouldn't put the rind in there. Mm -hmm. and. I just didn't start putting rinds. Now, cantaloupe also, they're sugary items, and, and worms just go, they love it because it's sugar. They got a sweet tooth. Uh, just like people, <laughs> just like me. <laughs> me too. And a sweet tooth. <laughs> Mr. Bill. Yes, sir. Great information. Appreciate that. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Tanya, so we just got finished learning about earthworms. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk about organic gardening. The two got, go together a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Can so I have a couple of questions for you okay. about organic gardening. What do we mean by organic gardening? Because we hear the term all the time, but what does it mean? It's a moving target. It means okay. different things to different people. So it means one thing to a farmer who's trying to grow commercially to sell their vegetables in a grocery store and have a an organic label on there. But today, we're not gonna get that technical. Okay. We're just gonna deal with um, what the average vegetable gardener in their backyard would consider growing organically. So that just means using all natural products and trying to reduce the amount of right. uh, pesticides that they use in general. Okay, all right, so what is the most important thing to know about gardening naturally or organically? I would say that prevention is key. The most important thing in my opinion, is if you're gonna to try to limit your use of chemicals. 
is that you set yourself up for success from the beginning. Um, good cultural practices because you don't want to wait until you have a large problem to deal with and then you're limited on what you can use mm. to combat the problem. Okay, so let's go back. Naturally versus organic though. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by naturally? It's well, uh, non-man-made okay. chemicals okay. for the most part. Okay, so, so it's natural. Okay, yes. I got you. All right, so what are some things you can do to prevent disease in your garden? Because, of course, you think about it, we've had a lot of rains yes. recently over the past month. We're getting a lot of calls at the office about diseases, so how do we mm -hmm. prevent those? Right, you want to try to prevent your disease before you have it, because once you have it, there's not a whole lot you can do about a fungal <laughs> right. disease. So the first thing um, you could do is grow varieties that have disease resistance mm -hmm. in their uh, genetic makeup. So uh, start out with a... Uh, a tomato plant that's already resistant to some of your fungal right. diseases. Um, of course, that usually eliminates most of your heirlooms, but if you're not interested in growing the heirloom or you're just starting out trying to grow organically, I would suggest start with a, um, a plant that has some disease resistance built in. Okay. And then when you, when you plant your garden, you want to make sure that you space things far enough apart so that you get good air circulation. Um, and good sunlight penetration. Mm -hmm. That's going to help dry out the moisture because moisture is going to breed your fungal problems, right. your fungal spores, like you were talking about good with point. the wet weather. Right. Um, another thing you want to do is, a lot of people don't think about mulching their vegetable mm -hmm. garden, but mulching your vegetable garden can go a long way in disease prevention because it provides a layer um, between your soil surface and your plant leaves so that when you water, you're not splashing fungal right. spores onto the leaves of your plants. Um, another thing you can do is practice crop rotation. That's very important. And what we mean by crop rotation is that you don't plant the same plant in the same spot year after year after year. Right. So you don't put your tomatoes in your same spot year after year. You want to put them on a three or four year rotation with other plants. And so um, one way to remember it is legume, root, leaf, and fruit. Okay. So you have different plant families that you are moving around, you can do it in a circular pattern or however way that you have um, designed it uh, in your garden plan, mm -hmm. but you don't want to put the same things in the same spots because you'll get a buildup of fungal, you could get a buildup of fungal material that particularly enjoy, for instance, peppers or eggplant. So you want to vary what you're planting in that same spot. So you mentioned crop rotation for disease purpose, but how about for insect pressure? Yeah. Yeah, you could do that too. Uh, for insect pre prevention, the right. first thing you want to do is scout. You want to scout your plants. So you want to get familiar with your garden and be out there every day looking around. Um, know what a squash bug mm -hmm. egg looks like. Um, know what an aphid looks like. If you're out there actively looking for problems, you can catch um, insect insect uh, populations before they get out of control yeah. and then you feel like you have to use something heavy to kill them but you know if you have a, a light infestation picking off the eggs of the stuff or you know spraying it down to get the aphids off or even using a sponge and soapy water mm. to get rid mm. of things in their early beginning stages right. um, so scouting your plants also don't kill your beneficial insects. Your beneficial insects like the ladybug, the ladybug um, kills, eats aphids. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. make sure that you don't kill your ladybugs and you need to know what the larval stage of the ladybug True. looks like because it undergoes a, a metamorphosis. And so most people don't know what uh, the larval ladybug looks like and they'll kill it inadvertently. And um, tomato hornworms, if you see one with uh, little white egg sacs all over its back, you want to leave that one alone because it's breeding more beneficial wasps to go out and kill your other tomato hornworms. So, um, and then there are other things that are harder contr to control like the squash vine borer. Yeah, that's, exactly that's a very difficult very one tough. to control, but um, one thing you can do, maybe not with 100% success, but you can try to cover up the the stems of the squash vines so that it's called a barrier method or exclusion method. Okay. You can either okay. cover the stems with mulch or keep on wrapping them with aluminum foil. I've yeah. done that myself, right. but that's kind of a bummer. But if you keep, <laughs> the, yeah, because you have to constantly go right. back and it's not foolproof, but um, cover the stems with mulch to provide a barrier between the squash vine borer uh, and the squash plant. So those are some things you can do for insect prevention. Okay.
Uh, so what are some organic things you can use if you have a problem to address? Okay, well I brought some things to show you today. Okay. The first one is an insecticidal soap. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is a very kind of a lightweight stuff for your soft bodied insects like spider mites and aphids and those type of things. Um, probably not going to work on your squash bugs, mm. but for um, light infestations, you can use an insecticidal soap. It's okay. very safe. Um, I brought some BT to show you. These are called BT dunks. And this is actually, if you have a, a rain barrel that you're using to irrigate oh, your yeah. garden with, you can put uh, BT is a soil borne um, organism that you just crumble some of this up in the top of your rain barrel mm -hmm. and it will, it controls mosquitoes. Right. So um, that's a way to keep a rain barrel to water your plants without the mosquitoes. Um, and you can also use a different type of BT to kill any kind of caterpillar that you have like your hornworms and right. such. That's right. Um, I did bring, this is horticultural oil and we use oil a lot of times on our fruit trees and things when they're dormant. Um, to kill scale. Mm -hmm. And so what an oil does is it coats the back of the scale or the other insects with the oil and so they can't breathe because a lot of insects, they breathe through spiracles in their back. Mm -hmm. And if you coat them over, they can't breathe and they die. So right. we have this um, horticultural and dormant spray oil that we can use on our trees and shrubs, okay. especially if you're growing fruit trees. Um, let's see, I brought some neem oil, it comes from the neem tree. And neem oil has a variety of uses. It can be used as insecticide, as a, a growth regulator. It messes up their ability to reproduce. Okay. Um, and it can make them grow kind of in strange ways so that you can maybe not kill them, but um, keep the population from getting larger. Okay. Some things, just because it is an oil, it will kill, just like the scale we just talked about, suff suffocating right. them um, through their back. And neem oil has also, also been used successfully to prevent um, powdery mildew. Okay. okay. Let's see, I brought this. Um, this is a combination thing, controls insects and fungal diseases, and it, it contains sulfur, and that's the part for um, fungal and it contains a pyrethrin and that's your insecticide part. Now this is a little bit heavier um, insecticide and maybe would take care of your squash bugs whereas insecticidal soap probably won't. Right. So um, if you've got some other things a little harder control you can go to the pyrethrins and pyrethrin comes from a uh, chrysanthemum mm -hmm. it's extract. And it's then lovely. I brought this diatomaceous earth that can be used for a lot of different things yeah. but in my landscape um, I have problems with slugs on uh -huh. my lettuce, trying to get my lettuce, and also my bedding plants in my front yard, so I use this for um, slug control. All right, Tanya, we appreciate that. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you much. Last week we talked about how to uh, mix up uh, malathion to control mealybugs on this mandevilla. Uh, this week I'm going to show you how to spray it. Now, you have an advantage, actually, an advantage to a small plant like this, I want to get with the wind at my back because I don't want to breathe this product and I'm going to spray to the point of runoff. I don't want to put too much on there but I also want to get good coverage and so you have to kind of get it a lick like this and I'm going to spin it on around so I don't get the wind at my face. Again, rubber gloves are very, very important when applying pesticides with a bottle like this. I'm, I'm, try, I'm making sure I'm getting to the underside of the leaves and the upper side. I think that ought to do the trick. All right, here's our Q&A session. Mr. Bill, you jump in there and help us out, all right? Yes, sir. All right, here's our first viewer email. Can I cut my roses back this fall, Tanya? What do you think about that one? The best time to cut your roses back is late February. Late February is when I do mine. Yes, my. late winter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, you would do that in late winter. I wouldn't do that now. You might get a flush of growth or something like that. Yes. It's going to be knocked out by a frost. So I always wait till pretty much late February, mm -hmm. early March to do that. Mm -hmm. You'll be just fine. And you can cut, I actually cut my back pretty, pretty hard. Yes, pretty hard. Yeah, and they actually grow back every year and look beautiful. So mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with it. All right, so here's our next uh, letter. We have a letter, believe it or not. People are still writing letters. <laughs> All right, so let me get this out. All right. So it says, I planted some dogwood trees three or four years ago. My dogwoods are about eight feet tall now, but they don't have a trunk or base, just long limbs. What's wrong? And this is from Melvin in Senatobia, Mississippi. So we, we appreciate that, Mr. Melvin. 
So, Tanya, the dog wars are eight feet tall now, but they don't have trunk or base. And Mr. Melvin, it would it'd be real good if we could have a picture of that so we can see that. Mm -hmm. but, but what are you thinking? Well, my first thought was, are we sure it's dogwood? Because mm -hmm. dogwoods are not usually multi-trunked. And then our, my second thought was, did they get topped somehow when they were young with a lawnmower, a weed eater, something that cut them off close to the ground and, and made them um, decide to branch into these long shoots? Um, I'm not really sure what else would make them do that. Do you have any other thoughts on? First thing that comes to mind is, yeah, something must have happened to it. Yes. Did it get pruned back too hard? Did somebody run over it or something like that? For, you know, for it to shoot up like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all I can think of. I can't think of anything else that would make it grow like that. I know. I can't either. Not a dogwood. No. No, I mean, dogwoods have problems, but. That's not you know, normally one of them. That's not normally one of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Mr. Bill, anything you can think of, perhaps? Well, <clears throat> grafting comes to mind. A lot of plants are grafted mm -hmm. today. And depending on how they graft it, it would how they shoot up extra shoot. I would imagine. Uh, be, be interesting, you know, if we had a picture just to kind yeah. of see that because mm -hmm. yeah. that could be a possibility. Yeah. You know, or it could have been hit with something, or you know, whacked back pretty hard or something like that. But yeah, if it's that tall and it's you may no want to base start no over. Trunk, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. I, I might yank that out and maybe yeah. go with something else. All right, Mr. Melvin. Hope that helps you out. All right, here's our next viewer email. When would be the best time of year to dig up my iris? I want to move them to another location. And this is Miss Betty in Arlington, Tanya. So she wants to dig up her iris and move them to another location. Now's a great time. Ah, there you yeah. Go. So July, August, and September is, according to the National Iris Society, <laughs> their, uh, what they say in other places, I did some research, is now is the time, July, August, and September, for you to um, dig up and transplant, move, whatever you want to do with your iris. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and it'll be just fine, right? Mm -hmm. kind of I would probably, you know, make sure that they were well watered but okay, yeah, during the winter. Yeah. But. Okay. Yeah, so good time to do that. Be fine. Uh, yeah, look for that other, you know, place that you want to put it in the ground and, uh -huh. you know, Hope for uh, cooler temperatures as we go uh, throughout the year. Yeah. <laughs> and I think your iris will be just fine, Miss Betty. All right, thank you much. All right, here's our next viewer email. What is causing small bumps on the leaves of my grapes? And what did you think about that one? There's one thing that comes to mind mm -hmm. to me is the grape phylloxera. Yeah. Um, you know, same thing, almost like a pecan phylloxera. Mm -hmm. You have a grape phylloxera, of course, and, and the feeding causes, of course, these little bumps that you will have on those leaves. And you know, from what I've experienced in the past, these leaves will actually drop off pre uh, prematurely. Hmm. You know, it can cause some defoliation. Uh, you can get some reduction in the photosynthetic process, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. um, but this late in the season, probably not much you can do. It's not too much you can do about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not going to be anything that you can really spray for it now because it's so late. Now, if you want to start, you know, back in the spring, I mean, there are some means that you can use to control that. Um, the fruit tree sprays contain malathion, which is something that you can use to, you know, control uh, the grape phylloxera. Some publications will tell you that there's a systemic that you can use as well uh, to control the phylloxera. But again, you will do that early in the spring. But this late in the year, it's not going to be too much you can do about that. Mm -hmm. It's another okay. one of the things you have to prevent. Right. And it's mm -hmm. something that you talked about earlier. So, yeah, you mm -hmm. just have to prevent it. All right. And somebody actually drop this off for us today to take a look at. And I'm just going to pop it on the table there. And here's the question that goes with that. So what are the white growths on the tomato hornworms? And this is from Stacy. And Tanya actually mentioned it earlier. So Tanya, yeah, yeah, that's, that you have today? yeah that's, that's the eggs from the parasitic wasp. And that poor hornworm is not feeling too great right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. But if you just let nature take its course, then all those little eggs will hatch and fly and find another tomato hornworm and uh, keep you from having to use a chemical to have to control those hornworms. All right. Beneficial insect. That's what it's all about right there. So mm -hmm. why would you want to spray anything on that? Mm-hmm. You wouldn't. Yeah, they already, you know, the parasitic wasp are actually doing the job for you. Mm -hmm. So this is what you want to see in the garden, Miss Stacy. Yeah. Yeah, you have that there. Just let nature take its tour, uh, course. Mm -hmm. Mother Nature has it all together. Mm -hmm. you know, she's going to get rid of that problem for you, so there you have it. All right. So, Mr. Bill, Tony, we're out of time. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, sir. Thank right. you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org. 
and the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. You can find more information on organic gardening and worm composting at familyplotgarden.com. While you're there, take a look at the gardening calendar or ask us your gardening question. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.